focusing on outer and mundane issues in their mosques, in the lives of Muslims, instead of study and analysis of philosophy, art, science, and civilizational discourse. It is important to note that Islamic scholars such as Ibn al-Rushd, Averroes, <coughs> is attributed to European Renaissance because of his translation of Aristotle's book from ancient, ancient Greek to Latin. Ibn Sina, Avicenna, the encyclopedic work on medicine, and Ibn Khaldun's work on sociology and history hugely contributed to the renewal of knowledge and enlightenment in Europe. The culture of change and constantly seeking excellence is embedded in the teachings found in the Quran. Is but anything, it is in every aspect of Islam. And guess what? Such culture is found in Europe every day. So, what I say to you all, Muslims are finding Europe not only a natural home for themselves, but they find Europe more Islamic than most Muslim countries. As to finish off, Islam is all about restoring balance in the world, reconnecting humanity with its root, reminding human beings about the need for spiritual and material harmony, and establishing fairness and justice in all realms of life. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe Europe has provided its citizens with a natural space to proliferate their life. This natural space to proliferate this lifestyle. Europe and Islam are not in clash. Islam has a lot to offer to Europe. And Europe has a brilliant, as a brilliant host to allow the Muslim and the growing Muslim population in its midst to find harmony and peace. My parents came to Europe for a better future. And I'm grateful to Europe as well as my parents for making that decision. Along with millions of other European Muslims, I'm extremely proud of my European identity. I am able to practice my faith freely today because I live in Europe. Is Islam compatible with Europe was the starting question. And my conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, is yes, certainly it is. In, is, in Muslim countries, there are many Muslims today, but you'll find very little Islam. In Europe today, there are very few Muslims, but you'll find a great deal of Islam. And that is the reason why I say Islam is perfectly compatible to Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Imam Masood, for this uh, inspiring lecture. Uh, I suppose many of us were not all that surprised that the answer to the question was yes, but uh, perhaps more perplexed by your claim that Europe is more Islamic than what we usually call the Islamic world. We have three respondents, and uh, without further ado, I give the floor to Adil Kuhn. <coughs> inspiring. Uh, I can um, condone everything you said. Uh, thank you for letting me have the floor first. Uh, after all, I am the oldest religion, at least representing the oldest of the three. I must say that I reacted to the, um, to the title um, as much as uh, everyone did. I mean, how can you ask the question, is Islam compatible, or as it was uh, written in Norwegian, how is Islam and plus Europa? Uh, it's an atrocious question, it's a stupid question, it's a, how can I ask the question? Uh, I'd rather speak under a heading called uh, why Islam is important for Europe. But on, on the first notion, I mean, um, We've had Muslims in Europe since uh, 700 ish, something like that. Um, and Europe from one day to the next is a different Europe. Europe evolves all the time. So Europe is not static. So uh, we have like 44 million Muslims in Europe today, depending on how you count. If you exclude uh, Turkey, for instance, it's 44. If you include Turkey, it's uh, much more. So it's impossible. Uh, in some way to ask the question. We have um, uh, a need for Islam and we have a need for Muslims. We see funny things these days. It's 
not so easy to attack Muslims, so we see a lot of attack on Islam as uh, a way of attacking the Muslim population. Why is Islam and Muslims? On the other, how can you? We have more than 40 million Muslims in Europe. How can you have Muslims without Islam? That's also funny. I came to Norway when I was five years old. I was born in Budapest in, in Hungary. And um, I reacted, I remember when I was a kid, people asked me, um, or I heard people ask other people if they were personal Christians. I haven't heard that in English before, but in Norwegian it's called personal Kristna. I didn't understand the question at all. And then we get questions like, um, uh, if I'm a believer. What these questions display is what I've learned from my Christian friends called majoritetsblindhet. We have now a very secular Norwegian society, but still we have Lutheran frames of references, where faith is the most uh, important part. So when you ask a Jew, or a Muslim, um, are you a believer? You might see that they get a glassy look and they are on a mentally, mental travel. But if you ask them, are you practicing, are you a practicing Jew? Then you see the light come up in their eyes and you get an intelligent answer. Like for instance, yes, I keep the Shabbat rules, I keep kosher rules at home but not outside. Or some way or another you get an intelligent answer. Same way with, the, with the, the Muslims. If you ask in what way you practice your, your um, Islamic faith, then you get um, an interesting answer. This shows that the Jews in Norway, which is a very tiny minority, is in need of the Muslim minority because it uh, uh, helps us um, or helps the Norwegian society of better understanding other religions. I have to say that tomorrow we start a um, conference here in this room, and you're all welcome, a conference uh, hosted by the um, uh, Norwegian Center Against Racism in companionship with the uh, Norsk Folkehjelp on right-wing extremism. It's a two-day conference where the first day focuses on Norway, and the second day focuses on the Nordic countries. I say this because um, uh, this is the country of uh, July 22nd, which means that uh, the attack of um, Anders Bering Breivik happened here um, in 2011. How did the Norway look before, I mean the day before the 21st, and how did it look the day after the 23rd of July? Was it very different? <coughs> and the sorry answer is, it's not very different. The 23rd of July, we would expect the country to be dramatically different, because what happened here was dramatic. But on the 21st of July, we saw the external threat, or the threat on the Norwegian society, on the Norwegian liberal democracy, coming from Muslims. And the day after, the same answer. And today, almost the same answer. What does this mean? This, what happened on the 22nd of July, the first couple of hours, before we knew that the perpetrator was a white Lutheran Norwegian, everyone was group thinking about Muslims. What happened after we knew who the perpetrator was, we stopped group thinking immediately and we saw him as an individual and we started giving him diagnosis and what we should have done is continue group thinking because he was one of us and asked the question how could this happen how could have this been prevented but still what we haven't done since July 22nd, 2011, is to look on the political ideologies, the beliefs the perp had, 
and do anything about it. So that's why this conference tomorrow, starting tomorrow, is indeed needed. Because we're talking about, I mean, pointing fingers on those who travel to Syria, and we don't know anything about those who travel to Ukraine to fight with the Russians. We don't have many of those in Norway, but we have some more of them in Sweden. And we know that right-wingers from Norway, they don't have a large physical environment, but environments today are not only physical, they are more virtual. Like Anders Bering Breivik, he was radicalized in his room for two and a half years on the net. So, since the physical environments are not huge right-wing environments in Norway, so they travel to Sweden on summer camps. So things being done in Sweden is not very far from Norway. But I'll come to the, to the question why Islam is uh, important for Europe. And I have three answers, not ten, but only three. Um, First of all, why is racism stupid? Why am I anti-racist? Why is it smart to be anti-racist? And with my background as a business leader most of my life, of course it's good for business. <laughs> racism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism is bad for business. Why? Because what they want they want homogenous societies. And we know, it's common knowledge, that heterogeneous um, groups, heterogeneous are more productive, more creative than homogenous groups. If you have a group of men and only one woman enters, the whole communication changes. So I have had success, so this is empirical, all my life, putting together groups with different sexes, different ages, different backgrounds, different religions, and uh, different uh, uh, educations. So heterogeneous groups are more productive, more creative than homogeneous groups. So who the fuck wants a homogeneous society? <laughs> The second is, <clears throat> I believe in um, religious autonomy. I believe in people choosing a value system. I look on religions as value systems, and it's important that you choose one. To be autonomous, you need to have the choices. So if you only have one choice, what choices do you have? That's the second answer. The third answer is that we have these um, uh, terms tolerance and pluralism. We often say that we want to be a tolerant society. I say that I want to have a pluralistic society. To be a pluralist demands more of you than being tolerant. To be tolerant means that I accept the other's difference. I don't like them, but I accept them. I can live with them. The pluralist sees a value in the other's value system. And that's a lot more demanding. Basically, the pluralist, pluralist thinks that all value systems have value. It's good for him. It might be good for me, but at least it's good for him, and then it's good for society. So, if we want to have a pluralistic society, which is a better society because it's more creative and it's more productive, it's better for business, we need Islam in Europe and we need Islam in Norway. Thank you. Thank you, Arvin, and uh, I'll say <laughs> proper thank you to you because uh, 
Unfortunately, uh, Arvin has had some urgent business on short notice that he has to take care of, so he will leave us. But thank you for taking the time and, saying, uh, and sharing your thoughts. And the rest of us will continue the discussion. Um, and the floor now is uh, Linda Alzacaris, please. Thank you very much. Um, special thank to the Imam who had shared his very uh, positive thoughts for us. <laughs> On a personal level, I of course agree with everything he said. Uh, this is also the way I believe in my religion. Uh, but I also think that when we are discussing these subjects, and we know that this is maybe one of the most uh, controversial uh, subjects in our time, I think we also have to <coughs> go a little bit deeper into the different uh, challenges that we are facing regarding uh, this uh, uh, polarized view on the Western values or European values and Islam. I used to be a very active um, Islamic feminist or a Muslim feminist. And I believed that um, referring to the Islamic texts, to the Quran and the Hadith and the traditions, that we would have, um, we would succeed to have some kind of gender equality and uh, equality between the sexes. Yesterday I got a question from a Norwegian scientist. Why isn't there more um, engagement around Islamic feminism in Norway? Norway is probably one of the most uh, feministic countries in the world. Feminism and gender equality is very, very has a very, very strong position in our society on the political level, among people of almost all uh, backgrounds and, uh, and ages. But still, uh, Islamic feminism is not very big in Norway. And I was thinking, why is that? Why I have even myself stopped thinking up so much about Islamic feminism? I think it's because what we are trying to do is just not feels relevant anymore. It feels kind of crazy having to argue for uh, equal rights that are so, um, you know, this is the rights we already have. It feels, uh, it feels uh, very strange to have to argue for the right of divorce, the right, the right of equal um, heritage, the right of uh, you know, deciding of your own life, if you are in a marriage, the right of, you know, leaving the house if you want to. This is the debates that are in, in the di discourses of Islamic feminism. And I think for most young Muslims, these are things that we are taking for granted. So we are having a huge uh, gap between the young generation and, and the older generation and the traditions. And it's also a paradox, because we also have another trend that is influence the whole discourse in Europe, is that also the young people are, or among the young Muslims, there are also trends of uh, very strong conservative uh, forces. We have, for example, Salafi movements who are gaining a lot of support among young people. Here in, in Norway, if we had a Salafi a lecture or preacher from the UK, this uh, room would be three or four times as full as this. He, we can have uh, like 3,000 people or 3,000 young Muslims coming and listen to that. And that itself shows that we have some serious problems. 
It's not that I think most Muslims in Norway, it, it's something between maybe 100 and 200,000, depending on how you count, whether or not you have a background from a Muslim country or you are registered in a, in a mosque. But somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000, I don't think most of those uh, people are supporting uh, the anti-human anti rights uh, preachers and and propaganda from, uh, from, for example, Salafi uh, movements. But it's a problem still that they are making so much noise, they are taking a very big uh, space in the media, uh, and they get a lot of attention. And they draw a lot of young people. I think it's because they are talking about all the different subject that we, for example, here are not still talking about. We are talking about all the unsolved businesses in within Islam that we have to deal with sooner or later. We have to deal with the fact that Islam probably is the only religion that still within the main, so-called mainstream, there are a lot of people who will not reject the idea of stoning someone. If you go to the mosque today and ask the imams, they will not reject it. They will not. They will say, "Okay, it's in a hypothetical Islamic state." Today we have a so-called Islamic state, and they are putting this kind of orthodox or classical theological thinking into practice. And we can say, "Okay, this is not Islam. This is not our belief." But the problem is that we haven't yet taken a, a stand or taking a position against these teachings. We are not talking about it or discussing it as much as we should uh, within uh, the Muslim minorities, but also open in the society. Because when we are not talking about this, when we Muslims are not talking about this, this is some of the, the reason that people are afraid of Muslims. So I think what most young Muslims today are uh, very concerned about is equality but for the law. This is one of the key um, points that are uh, gathering a lot of young Muslims. Equality before the law as, as, as citizens in Europe, as uh, Muslims, as women and men, this is uh, something that we can gather around. And of course, I think as an anthropologist, Islam is what we Muslims make it. Islam is a lived religion, it's alive, and it's there maybe now two uh, billion people who are the Islam that we have today in this world. And we have to uh, face that there are so many different Islams. Here in Norway, we don't have uh, one Islam. We have maybe hundreds of different of versions of Islam. And which is a good thing. Diversity is very good. But also, probably, we could also need to develop some kind of uh, notion of a, a Norwegian Muslim identity or like uh, Tariq Ramadan has been spoken about for a long time, a European Muslim identity. So I hope that we can discuss this further. Thank you. We'll definitely discuss that further in a few moments. Our last respondent is Espen Ottosen. The floor is yours. Well, it was very interesting to listen to your talk, Amal Masrur, and interesting to be here and talking about uh, Islam in Europe. Uh, I would start with saying that as a Christian, it is a bit difficult for me to talk about Islam in a general manner. 
There are so many different versions of Islam. And some versions uh, frightens me. Uh, and I'm happy to say that uh, this is not the versions Masrur has presented. He has presented a very appealing version of Islam. And many of the values he has uh, presented and talked about are in Concord uh, with my own Christian uh, perspective. And I'm grateful for that. Nevertheless, uh, I think it's important for me as a Christian and maybe for people in general who are not Muslims to be a bit cautious when talking about Islam in general. In, general. Uh, in fact, I think it's counterproductive often when non-Muslims try to establish what is real Islam. Uh, and especially it is problematic in Norway when people who are very critical towards Islam do say that real Muslims have to think so or argue this way or believe this or that. What they in fact do is saying that Islam has to be some extremist version uh, and that is really really problematic therefore it's important for me to say that uh, when I meet someone like Imam Ahmad Mazur and he presents what he thinks is important with Islam and his Muslim faith uh, I would acknowledge what is good, what we can stand together um, and not say that, well, most Muslims maybe think this or that. Um, it is of course possible to say something about what is common among Muslims, but it is even more important, I think, to give a Muslim the freedom to present what he or she really thinks. Well, I work in a mission organization, a Christian mission organization. And we have missionaries in many countries where there are a big majority of Muslims. I myself have visited a lot of these countries, I've been talking to a lot of Muslims and I've been talking to a lot of missionaries with years of experience in Muslim context. And my experience makes it important for me to say that the Muslim world is so much more than the world of extremists. Uh, Masrur in some way has explained that Europe is more Islamic than many Muslim countries. And I understand how you think, but I would also say that um, there are many nice things to, that can be said about so many Muslim countries. I have visited a lot and there are so much more to say than what we hear about from the newspapers when, where the extremists are uh, very uh, in focus. Uh, I don't want to hide that Religious freedom many places are in jeopardy. I know a lot of Christians with a Muslim background who have been severely persecuted because of their conversion and their Christian faith. And this is a real and persisting problem 
many places. But at the same time, there are many, many examples of peaceful co coexistence between Christians and Muslims. And I have experienced myself much, much friendliness and peaceful relationships in Muslim communities. It seems clear that Islam frightens uh, many Europeans. And to some extent that is the reason for this panel debate. And we know everyone, I guess, about these uh, ISIS, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab. These expressions provoke fear. Uh, and that is understandable to some extent. At the same time, it is true that for me as a Christian European, it's important to say that more Muslims than non-Muslims are victims of this terror. And, with a little smile maybe, for me as a European Christian, it's much more dangerous traveling by car in Europe than being attacked by these terror attacks. That is not what you think when you're reading a lot of newspapers. The next reason for fear among or from Muslims, I guess, guess is that many people think that increased Muslim population would lead to the destruction of classical Western ideals of freedom or something like that. Uh, and of course, it's very common in European countries to identify Islam with anti-democratic ideals. Nevertheless, I think it's really sad that so many people think that the main threat of Western life, so to say, is the presence of Muslims and the presence of Islam. At least it is a very, very, very one-sided perspective. Uh, I will have yeah. a look. I would like to give a small example. Um, because some days ago I found this book once more and read a bit of it once more. It's a book from 2001. It's from Britain, and I think that was why I thought about it. It's called Life at the Bottom. Theodore Dalrymple, a British psychiatrist, that writes the same year that the terror hit New York. He writes about the big and really tragic underclass in Britain. He writes about all the people suffering from or related to alcohol, drugs, uh, issues of psychiatrists, psychiatry, and he writes a lot about uh, all the crime committed by white, non-Muslim, uh, British underclass. And according to Dalrymple, the reason for this really tragic situation is what he calls a dysfunctional set of values. I think that what he, write, what he wrote in 2001 is uh, more or less true today. And to me it's 
a small example that it is so problematic to think that problems in the Western society has to do with the presence of Islam or the presence of Muslims. Uh, I would not say that the problem of the British or Norwegian underclass uh, is because of Western values. But even more absurd it is to think that everything is so good, so fine, so functioning in Europe and that the only problem is that Islam is growing in influence. And I would guess that me as a Christian, a conservative Christian, and the Imam uh, has a lot in common when we start talking about how to help and how to meet, for example, this threat in Europe, the threat to threat of uh, the underclass. As a conclusion, is Islam compatible to Europe? We heard in the introduction that all too many Europeans answers no. My main response is to say, of course, Islam is compatible with Europe because there are so many Muslims here. As a Christian, I started with saying that I would not talk so much about Islam in general. But for me, it's so important to say that there are Muslims in Europe, there are Muslims in Norway. I, it's necessary because of that to respect and to give every Muslim 